Hi, in this video, I'm going to walk you through setting up a new tournament on tabroom.com. So the first thing you're going to need is if you don't already have an account on Tabroom, you'll need to create that account. Once you've logged in, tabroom.com looks like this with your email address showing across the top taskbar. To create a tournament, you're going to need to go to your account page by clicking on your email address. This is, of course, where you go also to register for tournaments, but today we're going to create one. Your screen might look a little different from mine, but if you go down the right side, you will see the button to request a new tournament. So on this screen, we'll fill in the basic information. We'll name our tournament. Like it says, do not include the year of your tournament. I'm creating a tournament for this year's virtual debate, so it's going to be a brand new tournament. The web name is just if you want to have a special web address associated with that tournament. You don't have to. You set the dates for your tournament, whenever it would be the first day of competition and the last day of competition. The times are not very important. New this year, they have the option if you're using an online service to run your tournament rather than being in person, you could choose one of these boxes. I'm planning to host on NSDA campus, so I'm going to choose that. This clone setup is a very useful feature for many of you who might be creating your very first tournament because all you really need is someone else who has created a tournament before and you can have them work to clone you a copy of a tournament so you don't have to go through all of this setup from the beginning. Additionally, once you've created a tournament one year, you can clone that tournament in future years. You'll see I have a bunch of tournaments in that dropdown because I end up being an admin on many tournaments around the season. So any tournament you're an admin on, though, you can clone in future years. Then I'm going to set my deadlines. They are all fairly self-explanatory. It's just a matter of when do you want your registration to open? When do you want to close to new entries? And this might be especially important in our time of virtual competition, when you might need to know how many rooms you're buying from NSDA campus or a similar service. When do your fees freeze? When do your judges need to be turned in if you're having folks bring judges? and the rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. The next thing it asks is for tournament circuit. You can choose, and your screen might look slightly different than this, but whatever circuit you would like to be listed in, what that will do is it will ping the administrators of that circuit who can then approve your tournament being listed. So I'm just going to list my tournament in Kansas. And then it says we want a host site. This year I'm using NSDA Campus, so that will take care of anything else that we're doing. Otherwise, you can use a host site by dropping down and finding your school in the list or typing in the name of your school if it's not already showing up in the list. And now the request has been confirmed. The tournament exists, and my circuit administrators have been notified. How do I get into that tournament to make the other changes that I want to make? Well, we have to go back to our home screen, and then you should see the tournament show up on the right side under this tournaments heading. You can also get back here by clicking on your email address. It's just in your account page, and this will remain there anytime you want to access this tournament. Now, if I click on the tournament, it will take me to the registration screen where it shows me all the schools who have registered. Now, since I just created this tournament, there's no one in that dropdown. But I'm going to focus today on going through the different settings underneath your tournament. So first on the tournament tab, this is where you put the name of all the things we already selected. You can choose those again. 
When I am ready with an invitation, I can upload it via this link. If your tournament has a Congressional Debate Division and you want to upload legislation, you can do that here. You can also upload a school or program logo if you want, and any forms that your district might require. For instance, if your tournament is recording participants and your district has informed you that you need to have a release form associated with that. Under the General tab, there's a variety of options you can choose. For instance, you can choose to have there be adult contact information as part of registration. I think that's usually a good idea. I like to log registration changes because I'm a little bit of a micromanager and I like to know that. I don't want this to be a test tournament. You can make a test tournament, though, where you can put in dummy entries and practice scheduling, tabbing, and seeing how the rest of the tournament works. I will go ahead and publish the list of schools that are registered. I don't mind that. School code style, you can choose this later, but right now it's just going to use a shortened school name. I'm going to save the settings. Down here there's also online on-site registration that you might want to choose later on as you're getting your tournament close to the day of. Under dates are all the options that we already selected. They're just in a different spot here. So this is where you need to make changes to anything we already selected. Under the access tab is where you can add anyone else who you would like to have helping you run the tournament. So they need to have a tab room account and you can add them by typing their email address over here and then if you grant them access you can choose which level of access they should have you can make them the owner instead of you you can make them an administrator which gives them everything or you can give them limited access to parts of the tournament or just data entry access this last one can be helpful if you're running a tournament where you might have students helping out in the tab room but you don't want them to be able to mess with any of the more behind the scenes functions the messages tab is where you set up where folks should send their payment as well as any other message you want on the invoices or on registration. If you've seen a tournament where you register and that cool little pop-up comes up that you have to click through before you're allowed to register, then you can put a message up here. You can have a message that comes along with an email when someone's released from the wait list or with Congress legislation. The housing tab, oh, see, and it warns me I may not have saved this, so I'm gonna go down to save messages. You always want to save before you go to another tab. The housing tab, we don't probably ever have tournaments in Kansas where you need that. The notes tab is entirely internal notes to you. So anything that you want to record and preserve as part of this tournament, as sort of your own private notes, you can use that here. Merge is probably not going to be something most of us want to use. So that's under the settings tournament. Moving on to rules and results. This is where you're going to want to spend a little bit of time thinking about how you want wins and losses to be recorded and how your standing should be worked out. The tiebreaker set that we will all probably need is the debate prelims set. So I'm going to click on that here on the right side in the blue. And you can see the default is more of a national circuit style approach to tiebreakers. Wins and losses should be the first tiebreaker. Yes, we agree on that. But then when it says points, it's talking about quality points, those 20 to 30 numbers that many tournaments have judges give. If you want to have quality points on your ballot as part of your tiebreakers, you can do that. But if I want to run a tournament just following the Keisha rules, I'm going to go ahead and eliminate those tiebreakers, as well as the opponent seed Right now, the only tiebreaker that I'm leaving behind is the win and loss record. Now, if we want to have the next tiebreaker be the ranks, if I click on the tiebreak type, you can see you have a variety of options. I want to have ranks. Priority two means it'll be underneath this one. 
I don't want to drop any scores. I don't want to multiply any scores. I just want exactly this. So I'm going to create that tie break. And now it'll do wins and then ranks. Then I can do opposition wins. Opposition ranks. And you know what? At that point, if you're still tied, I want you to flip a coin. This is the most common way you'll probably want your tiebreaker set up. But again, if you're doing quality points, they might be a part of your tiebreaker somewhere. Or if you're experimenting with a different order from the Keisha handbook, then that might be your approach as well. If you're giving speaker awards, you can set up those speaker awards on the debate speakers tab on this same link. If your tournament is awarding sweeps, this is where you set your sweepstakes rules. I'm going to set up a rule called debate sweeps. Now when it talks about event, we're going to set that up in a moment where each event basically is a division. So I want to count your top four entries. I don't have to put anything in these blanks. If I don't care how many entries count per event, I can leave it blank. If I don't care that you have someone in all the divisions, I can leave that blank. So right now this would just look at the top four teams in any, in any division. And I'm going to save that setup. But you'll note I haven't told it how to actually calculate it. I just told it here who to calculate. Down here you can change what events once you have events and what rounds you want to exclude. If I click on rules, right now I see nothing. That's because you need to use add rules to create what you want here. You can have sweeps points based on the placing every time they appear in a round but we probably want just debate wins and losses. A win is a point, add that. And if I go to my rules, I get one point per win for my top four teams. For most of our tournaments, that's probably going to be all we really want. You'll notice I can't uh, use, I can do ranks totals in IE or Congress, I can't do it in debate. So if you need a tiebreaker on your sweeps based on how many Kansas tournaments do it, you're still going to have to do that by hand. The points and bids is not really relevant to us in most of our Kansas tournaments, but that's what you would do if you had an NDCA or TOC kind of a thing going on. Next, I'm going to look at my judges. You'll begin setting up judges by adding a judge category. Depending on how you're setting up your tournament, you might want to just have all your judges in one category or have your judges in a combination of several categories. I'm going to create the JV and open judge pool and hit save. Then it gives me all my other options. I highly recommend that you suppress judge codes and the reason is because your judge codes tend to be three and four digit numbers that in a world where we're back on paper ballots will print on those ballots. You probably don't want that because they look a lot like room numbers and they're a lot bigger in font than the room number is on the ballot. That's always confusing to folks. I tend to suppress the judge code so it will just print the names. You can publish the list of judges on online for your participants to see. You can require judges to have a tab room account. Normally I don't click this, but for a virtual tournament it's essential. And I'm going to ask for judge phone numbers as well this year. These are options I would not normally check, but for a virtual tournament, it's going to be important. And there's a variety of other options you have as well. If you want people to need judges to cover the entries they're bringing, you can do that here under the burden method. I'm going to say that for every two entries, you need to bring a judge. And I'm going to save that. So now I have a judge category, JV, and open. Hires is a system where it's more relevant to National Circuit where folks can hire judges from your community pool. I'm not going to go into that detail right now. Under tabbing is a number of options as to how your judges are set. 
and then how they are entered. For the most part, in our virtual world, we're not going to worry about entering judges' ballots because they will enter the ballots for us when they'd make their decisions. But over here, this option doesn't really apply to us in policy debate. It will already allow them to get the same event twice. That's more for forensic folks. Allowing panels with same school judges is up to your discretion. Randomized judge assignments. I've never really figured out exactly whether this makes a difference in policy itself. If you're using some kind of a diversity tracking system to manage your judge preferences, but a lot of this doesn't apply because we probably, most of us aren't using judge preferences. And here you have the option to turn on an online training ballot for your judges if you're wanting to bring them in through a clinic. This can be really helpful. And then there's a variety of options themselves for the ballots. Again, many of these will be for the printed ballot that won't apply to the online balloting that we're using this year. Ratings is associated with judge preferences. Most of our tournaments won't be doing that, so I'm not going to get into that. Some people can set up, find this very useful, this judge shifts idea. It is a little bit confusing because what you're doing is you're setting up time blocks where a judge is not available. So... Many of our tournaments, a school might not bring a judge to cover their entry the whole day. They might bring someone in the morning and someone in the afternoon. This screen allows you to set up various judge shifts in order to do that. For instance, I can say Saturday a.m. It's on Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon. I'm not going to use that method. I'm going to use judge notes to manage that. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that shift, but this is an option that's available to you. Now I clicked on the next tab, which was the pools, and it won't let me create pools yet because I don't have a site location. This is where I need to configure NSDA campus before I can move forward. So here is where I need to try and predict how many rooms am I going to need and on what days am I going to need them. So if I think I'm going to need 40 rooms on Saturday, 8 rooms on Sunday, and 20 rooms on Friday, I would purchase 68 rooms. And if I do that, it's going to take me to an invoice and set everything up. You can add those later. So if you just need to have a site set up to get going, you could purchase a very small number of rooms and get started. But judge pools are how I tend to manage each round of judging. So you would have a pool for open round one, a pool for open round two, and so forth. That then your tournament's going to pull from. Now I'm going to look at the settings events. And this is empty because I haven't created any events. Now all of our events probably will be policy debate. So when it says event, what it really means is division. So I've got first the open division. It is helpful to have a shorter abbreviation. You can decide how much your entries are going to cost. I'm not sure about that yet, but I'll put in a number here and make a guess. 
You can decide how you want your entry codes to be. And this is for NSDA point purposes. We tell it it's a debate event at the open level. And if I hit save, now a couple other options show up. I can put in NSDA points for policy debate. And I don't have the policy tournament option listed here yet, so I'm going to leave that blank. So, and I'll save again. And I would redo this for each division that I create. So if I want to create a JV division, I would do that as an add new event. But now I'm going to take you through the other categories here under the event settings. On registration, you can set specific registration deadlines for that division. You can break Keisha rules by allowing multiple schools to team together. I usually do click on this to publish the list of entries for folks. I do like to maintain a wait list. I just wait list everyone. This I think is good practice, especially for us who don't necessarily know how big a tournament we're going to end up wanting to host. And I think the other settings are probably not going to be very important to you. So again, I save settings before I move to another tab. Now there's a new tab here which is online. I can click yes to go to online event to indicate how we are doing this. You can set up a role. And how the different names should display. Under your pairings setting, most of these are going to be left blank. Many of us do allow, if we have ELIM rounds, we allow judges to judge repeat times in ELIMs. Down here on the powering method, if you want a more traditional tournament, you would use seeds only. If you want to use the more advanced processing power of a computer system like Tab Room, the SOP will provide a slightly better power match most of the time. And again, the pull-up method, SOP is going to be the best for most people. And there's a variety of other options that you have. For instance, if you want brackets to be more important than sides, you'll click that button. You have other options related, related to your pull-ups. This, I do always click on disable auto scheduling because again, I'm a bit of a micromanager. What this will do if you leave it off, if you leave this no, then auto scheduling means once you've finished a round, the next round will automatically be paired and set up ready to go. It won't necessarily publish itself unless you've also set it to do that, but this will assume that you have everything already set up the way you want it. And so I like to be able to click those extra buttons. I usually disable that auto sectioning. If you're hosting a little novice tournament where judges can judge their own school, you could turn that on. You'll definitely, those live updates will be essential this year, so I'm going to enable those. In Kansas, most of us probably don't want to auto-publish results or blast the results. These are for circuits where it's more common for folks to make the results of rounds more public more often. So I'll save those settings and then go to tabulation. This tab is all about speaker points and quality points. If you are not using quality points, you don't need most of this. However, I am going to come down to Use online ballots. You can set a minimum word count for your RFDs, which is cute. You can set deadlines for when the decisions are. And if you have ELIM rounds where you don't want the judges to be to find out how it ended, you can hide that decision from them. 
I'm going to save those settings and go to my ballot. This is where you can type the topic for this year. You can put some other text on your ballots, any other messages you want for your judges. This does show up in an online ballot. And you can also give any information you want about the speech times or point scale that you want to be the norm at your tournament. And finally, for updates, you can receive messages when the first or last ballot is entered and confirmed in a particular round or in a particular event. You can also set up automatic backups, which can be really helpful. It'll just email you a backup anytime a round is blasted, deleted, or completed. That can be helpful if something happens with the tournament, then you still have the data that you can re-upload and set up. If I wanted to create more divisions, you can either add new event here, And when I do that, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I can choose JV and then clone settings of open, and it will run everything exactly the same way. You may want to go through and make sure that everything looks the way you want, though, because like I notice, it didn't change my entry fees or my number of competitors. So you do still want to probably quickly page through those tabs if you're creating multiple divisions. The schedule. There are two parts to creating your tournament schedule. The first is creating your time slots. So for instance, if I want to create a time slot here on Friday round one, that is going to be starting at 4 o'clock, and ending at 5.30, and I'll add that time slot. And then I want Friday round two. I'll say it starts at 6.30 and ends at eight o'clock. That may be aggressive, but we'll see. The one important thing is that you should not ever have these time slots overlapping, because if you do, Tab room will be confused and it will think your judges from round one cannot turn around and judge in round two because they're overlapping time slots. So these are just the slots where a round could happen. I'm now going to go to Saturday and create four more time slots. So I'm going to create Saturday round one, starting at 8 a.m. to 9.30. Saturday round two, 10.30 to noon. Saturday round three, 1.30 to 3 o'clock. And Saturday round four, 4 o'clock to 5.30. You can set your times however you like. I'm just trying to model the recommendations from the uh, folks who did this. Now I've made Sunday available for when I go back and set up my DCI division. JV and Open won't be using those time slots. So. I've set up some time slots. I still have not scheduled any events. You see here in the red, JV and Open still say they have no round scheduled. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go click on JV, and each of my time slots that I've created shows up here on this screen. I want my JV to be a one-day Saturday tournament. So I'm going to set those four rounds from Saturday. If I do it like this, prelim preset, just means all four of these would be random preset debates. I don't want to do that. Round one and two I want to be preset, but then after that I want to do power matching. You can do either high-low or high-high power matching, or if you want to set up elimination debates, you can do that. But I'm going to set this up as a high-high using debate prelims, and then round four is high-high using debate prelims. You can also use high-low pairing if you like, it's however you choose to run your tournament. 
Oh, and then it's, see, it warns you. I need to have every round using the tiebreaker set. So now I have a JV schedule. I have four rounds of JV set on Saturday. In open, I want to start on Friday and then continue on Saturday. The Friday rounds I want to be preset. I still do need to say debate prelims for all of these tiebreakers. Because I'm choosing to run just a six round tournament with no elims. If you wanted to use elimination rounds, you can change these last couple to elimination rather than prelims. And here, since we have more rounds, I'm going to go a mix of high low and high high in my pairings. And then I'll save those rounds. So now you can see in JV, we have four rounds just on Saturday. In open, I have six rounds, two Friday, and four more on Saturday. I didn't name the rounds anything. It will automatically give us rounds one, two, three, four, five, six. If you want to call them anything different, you can do that. For sites and rooms, again, that's going to be set up to my NSDA campus. So that will happen as part of your purchasing of rooms through NSDA campus. Normally, when you're hosting a tournament physically, this is where you can set up the rooms that you have available to you. But for this year's tournament, we don't need that. The money settings are just little nuance parts of your tournament if you want to set up particular fees for a variety of things. You may want to consider, for instance, fines for when a judge no-shows or if there are late drops or ads because NSDA campus costs money that you have to pay in advance of your tournament and cannot be refunded. And then finally, if I go to settings website, this is where you can configure the site that the people see on the front page of tabroom.com. You can put in text in your main page, any of your entry fields reports, or judge lists, or on your schedule postings. You can also add custom pages if you have information about the tournament that you want to have on your own page. Good common custom pages would be like your schedule or any policies that you're using that differ from the Keisha standard rules. Once you've made all that set up, you are pretty much ready to be open for registration. I'll make some later videos about managing registration and how you go through the process of preparing the rest of your tournament. But this has your tournament completely set up and just waiting for your circuit administrators to approve it so it'll be listed on tabroom.com.